Hello, I'm Dale Yurton, and welcome to our study on marriage today. I'm entitling this lesson, Don't Dance Alone. And I think as we go through the lesson, you'll see why I have chosen this particular title. This was the greatest day of King David's life. He's bringing the Ark of Co the Covenant into Jerusalem, his new capital city. You'll see that in 2 Samuel 6 and 16, as the Ark of the Lord came into the city of David. Oh, it doesn't get any better than that. He's the new king. He's approximately 40 years of age, give or take just a year or two there. He's the new king. He became king of Israel when he was 37. This is just a short time after this. Almost 40 years old and the new king of Israel. And he's celebrating by bringing the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. He attempted to do this once before and it was a terrible failure. He just did it the wrong way. And that is a point that we must all understand. Sometimes we are attempting to do God's will and we mess it up by doing it the wrong way. That's what he did. Now here's his second attempt to bring the Ark to Jerusalem and he is successful. It is a great day of celebration. And then after he's given gifts to everybody, he goes back to his own house, his own home, to bless his family. That's why he's coming, to give them gifts and, and have them join his celebration of the greatest day of his life. And what a shock when he got to the door. He meets an unhappy wife. Any of you husbands ever done that? You got home and you had done something you should not have done because she's not happy with you. That's what he faces. And so the first point I want to share with you today in this amazing story is Michael's infection. She's hurting. She's sick. And David doesn't even know it. He doesn't even know what's going on in his house, under his roof. He doesn't know what's taking place in her life. Let me show you some of the reasons why. Michael was his first wife. And I'll start this point A is, who am I? If, if I could give you counsel for Michael, I would say, weep for Michael. Why weep for her? Because this being his first love, she once loved David dearly, but she had been treated like a political pawn. Her dad, being the king of Israel, King Saul, he used her to try to kill David. Now, that's not a good experience. And then David, after he marries her, he neglects her. And David, even now, just what has occurred in the last few years was David as the king of Hebron. And Abner, the general of Israel, wants to reconcile Israel with the tribe of Judah, with David. And he goes to him and David said, I'm not going to see you unless you bring Michael. And what he's doing, he's, he's putting him to the test. And so Abner brings Micah to see David. But she's being treated like a political pawn. It's no wonder that she's infected with apathy and is afraid to love. That's the reason she didn't join the celebration that day. No, she hides behind windows, looking out the window rather than joining the dance of life. David doesn't understand what is going on in his wife's life. He doesn't understand the hurt, the infection that is on the inside. He doesn't understand Michael. Now, the second question I would ask, point B, is who is he? We're speaking of David here. David is 
not the young warrior that she once loved, so much so that she risked her life for him. Uh, no, no, he's not the young warrior, the champion that kills the giant. He's now a middle-aged man, approximately 40 years of age. He, too, has changed. See, the truth is, the warrior boy that she remembered died long ago in a cave, hiding from her daddy, King Saul. That, those days are over, the days of innocence, the, the days of young love. They are far past, and now she's looking out the window, watching in jealousy as this stranger is dancing before the girls. That's the way she sees it. Who is he? Who has he become? She no longer knows, and at this point, she doesn't care. See, the truth of it is, life is a journey, my friend. Life is a journey. We're going somewhere. We're not remaining the same people that we were yesterday. And both Michael and David have drastically changed. They're not young lovers anymore. They're a middle-aged couple that has grown apart. Life has separated them, and so many experiences, many of them that were forced upon them, have caused them to go different paths. And so their lives have radically changed. The third thing I want to share with you concerning her infection is point C. I call it, who are we? See, by each of them changing, had changed the relationship. At one time, she loved David. The Bible says that. The Bible says, and Michael loved David. When Saul heard about it, he thought, oh, good, here's my opportunity to get rid of David. But things have changed over the years. What she has experienced, what she has gone through now causes her to scorn him. And she looks upon him with disdain. She doesn't like what she sees. Now, why has all of this happened? Because when you look back, at, at one time, David loved Michael enough to fight for her. He literally risked his life in killing 200 Philistines. I mean, th th that, that's how much his love was for her. But as I said, they were separated by her father and David doesn't go to look for her. Why doesn't he go? The Bible doesn't say, but he neglected her. He didn't go and then you have to ask on her part, why didn't she go find David? Her brother Jonathan did. Why doesn't she follow Jonathan to David? He's able to find him if Jonathan can find him he could have certainly helped Michael get to David. But it's not in the story. The Bible doesn't tell us why they didn't. It simply records they didn't find each other. And time took a toll on them so that now on this greatest day in David's life, when the person he would have enjoyed being there watching the celebration more than anybody else. Participating in this dance is Michael. And yet she hides behind the wall and looks out the window watching him dance in the street. Now, I, I would close this first point by giving you the counsel, the advice. Don't stop dancing. That's what she's wanting him to do. Don't stop dancing. Michael had stopped dancing, and now she wants David also to stop dancing. Don't do it. That's a mistake. Don't add to the mistake and, and leave God out or blame God for your problem. Why did you let this happen to me? No, continue the dance, or I would say your expression of worship and love toward God. Don't allow anything to destroy that because your marriage is already in trouble and you don't want her infection 
to become your infection. The second part of this lesson I'm going to call David's illusion. David's illusion. David basically is making a mistake again of taking his wife for granted. He's, he's living in the past, so to speak. And so point A, I, again, we're going to ask some questions from David's perspective. A, who is she? He doesn't understand her. He's taking her love for granted again. He's saying, well, she'll be okay. I, I know she hasn't been real happy lately, but she'll be all right now. She's back. She's the queen of Israel. What could go wrong? Well, a lot has gone wrong. See, when we look back at the story, we see at first she resisted her father. She actually lied to her father. I wouldn't encourage you to do that, but she did that. She said, he threatened my life. I don't believe that was true. David loved her. But she's telling her father this story so he won't harm her. But then David doesn't return. He doesn't come back. The years go by and David is still gone. And something begins to happen in the thoughts and the heart and emotions of Michael. Now, over time, her father gives her away in marriage to another man. She comes under the influence of another man that we've never heard of before. I'm sure that Saul was attacking her marriage. And now, what does she remember? She doesn't remember David fleeing for her li his life. No, what she remembers is when David took her away from her new husband and the new husband following behind her crying while, when she left home. That's what she remembered. She had no choice in this matter. The, and the general had come and the, with his army and he commanded, you're coming with me. She has no choice. As I said, she's treated like a political pawn and she resents it deeply. David is not taking that into consideration. He's simply saying, you were my wife at first, I'm the king of Judah now, you're going to be my wife now. The second thing I would like to answer is a question, point B. Why does she do that? See, not only has David changed, and he knows he's changed, God is fulfilling his prophetic promise to him. He is now the king of Judah. He's changed. He knows that. But he doesn't know that Michael has changed. See, this is not the girl he once loved. This is not Saul's youngest daughter. No, not at all. No, Michael is now a middle-aged woman. And uh, it's one of the sad things in life, but those that know us best are the ones that can wound us the most deeply. No one can hurt you like your first love. She's a disappointed woman. Her father was king. Now her husband is the king. And the truth of it is, she is afraid to love kings. She's afraid to open her heart to kings because she sees what royalty does to some men. It's not just royalty. I remember a man that became a multimillionaire and he said to me one day, money changes you. And he was talking about the millions of dollars that he had and how it had changed the way that he thought who he was. Well, the same is true with royalty. Now, she's married to a king she's afraid of. She's afraid of him. She's afraid of, of opening her heart. She's afraid to join the dance of life because of the things which she has gone through, the things which she has experienced. May God help us to understand. And, and uh, I, I think this is the responsibility of husbands, that if we're going to be leaders in our family, leaders in our home, it's our responsibility to understand what is going on in their lives. It's our responsibility to 
take good care of our families, not just provide for them and think because we put food on the table that everybody's happy. We've got to understand what's going on in their life. David is failing terribly in his relationship with Michael. Failing, terrible. And so that brings me to point C that I want to talk about in this story. The question that David needs to answer is, what can I do with her? What can I do with her? The first thing I would say is, take time to court her again. You may be the general of your army, but she's not a soldier. No, in fact, there's a verse of scripture in Proverbs 18 and 22 that's translated in a very, very popular translation, one of the greatest translations we've ever had in English, where it says, it says that to the man that God has given a wife, he's given a good thing. Now, if you'll note that word thing in the English translation is in italics, meaning it was added by the translators to try to communicate to us. The thing is not the woman he's talking about there. The thing is marriage. Marriage is the thing. The woman is not a thing. She's a woman. And you've got to treat her with respect. You've got to show respect to her feelings, to the things that matter to her. David's not doing that. He's acting like a general. He's giving orders. He's commanding it. You do this, you do that, and said, go get Michael and bring her. She was my first wife, and if you want to talk to me, you've got to bring Michael. Boy, that, that is so disrespectful to, of her own thoughts and emotions. So take the time to treat her with respect. That's what you can do. Take the time to court her again. I remember hearing a man say, I'm not going to go running after his wife had left him, and you know, I'm not going to go chasing after her. And I wanted to respond and say, you did the first time. What's changed now? See, God help us as men to understand we're dealing with a human being, a person that has feelings, that has concern, and we've got to learn to be considerate about it. Now, oh yes, she, she's really bad-mouthing him. She's saying things she should not be saying. You really put on a show before the girls today. David said, it wasn't, I wasn't showing off before the girls. I was dancing and worshiping God. David understood something. He might be the king, but he's not God. God is the king. And he's saying, I'm expressing my love, my devotion, my joy, my happiness to my God. And so I would give you the same counsel. Don't allow their infection to become yours. Don't stop worshiping. Continue to seek after God. Continue to worship God. Continue to give your heart to God, even your tears to God. And it might be that God will answer those prayers and see your tears and restore your wife to you again. And so I would close the second part of this lesson by saying, save the last dance for me. I don't want to grow old alone. When I get to the end of my life, I want you to be there. And I want you to save the last dance for me. Now, the third part of the lesson, I'm going to entitle this, Build a bridge. That's what David should have been doing. Building a bridge, I'm talking about in his relationship with Michael. This is what he should have been doing. Building a bridge with her. See, when your wife loves one thing and you love another, build a bridge. That's a good time to build a bridge. When, when your wife, when she's motivated by something that doesn't interest you, build a bridge. Reconnect with her again. When, when your wife, when, when she's giving you something you don't need, build a bridge. That's what David should have been doing. 
David should have been looking for ways that he could reconnect their relationship, that they could start communicating together again. There's three things that I want to say in building a bridge. Point A, face the clock. None of us are getting any younger. David is not a young man anymore. David is a middle-aged man, approximately 40 years of age. If we're not careful, we will die in the arms of a stranger. And that's what's going to happen to David. David was a great king, but he was not a great husband. He was not a great father. No. And he allows his marriage to be destroyed and ends up in the arms of a stranger. You have to ask him, who is this Abishag? This is at the end of David's life, and now we're introduced to a woman we've never heard of before. She's young enough to be his granddaughter, and her name is Abishag. They brought the king a new bride, a new wife. That was the last thing that David needed at that point in his life. Another question is, where's Michael? Where's Michael? What, where is she? We don't know. In fact, at this point of stage of her life, she's dead. She's gone. But she's not there. She is gone. Oh, may God help us not to do this to our marriages. Point B is face the fatigue. Face the fatigue. See, the truth is, young people waste energy fighting over trivia. Things that really don't really matter. Nobody can warm your heart like an old friend. I remember a wise, older pastor saying to me one day, he said, when I, I see young couples fighting with each other, said, I, I used to give them counsel. Maybe you just need to put a little space in your marriage and just separate a little bit until your emotions calm down and you get over your anger and you stop your fighting. He said, I'm older now and hopefully wiser and I don't give that counsel anymore because I've learned if, if they separate, there's a good chance that they will end up in divorce. And if they end in divorce, they've lost their family. They lost their marriage. And he said, no, I, I don't advise them to do that because I've learned that they will get older. And as they get older, they won't have as much energy. And when they don't have as much energy, they won't fight so much. And he said, whereas if they divorce, separate, they have lost everything. Those are words of wise counsel from an old soldier. So don't make that mistake. Face the fatigue. You and I are getting older. David now finds himself at this stage of his life. He's an old man surrounded by strangers, people we've never even heard of. And yet here they are around David. He, he could ask this question, who is this young woman holding my hand? They brought him to be his bride. She became his nurse. He didn't need a new bride. He needed somebody to take care of him. He's dying. Who is the young woman that's holding my hand? And then point C, the third thing I would say is face the mirror. Everybody's changing, not just Michael, but David as well. What we need to do is learn to grow closer by rediscovery, by rediscovery. See, the truth of it is David has lost touch with reality. You read this in 1 Kings, the first chapter, verse 4, and then it's repeated in verse 11. It said David didn't know what was going on in his kingdom. Oh, you're running out of time. Don't wait until too late to get started. Or as I said, don't dance alone. The sad thing is in this story, Michael's bitterness has turned into barrenness. She lives and dies childless without her own baby. 
It was the old country preacher. His, his English wasn't so good, but uh, the grammar wasn't so good. But he said, if you don't dance, you ain't going to have no baby. Boy, that is the truth. That's her mistake. She has become the old bitter woman, the old bitter wife, and she dies childless. In fact, it tells us in 2 Samuel, the sixth chapter and verse 23, that she dies alone, the daughter of Saul. Those are sad words. As I said, weep for Michael, weep for her. She dies alone, the daughter of Saul, when she could have been the wife of King David. David was the greatest king alive. She could have been the first woman he married. She lost it because she became bitter. David, David spends his final arms and hours in the arms of a stranger, someone we'd never met before. It's no wonder the Bible says he was cold, the old cold king. Now let me close with a couple of statements you need to understand. No one can appreciate the enormity of your success unless they have seen the ferocity of your struggle. See, they, it's impossible for them to appreciate who you are if they haven't seen where you come from. That's what's happening to David now. And here he is, the old cold king, left alone in the last moments of his life with a stranger. And so I admonish you in your marriage, don't dance alone.